firstly, I just want to say thank you very much for having me on today. Um, and thank you to everyone who's watching. I'm really excited to share what I know about degrowth with you all. Um, and I also sort of want to preface this presentation by saying that I know it's fairly unorthodox, a little bit unusual perhaps to challenge the notion of growth. It's sort of highly ingrained in our collective psyche that growth is good and that we want more growth and we want to grow. Nature grows, everything in nature grows, um, that companies should grow, that countries should grow. And so I ask you to keep an open mind while I take you through these slides tonight. Um, and just see, uh, just see if perhaps you might see where I'm coming from by the end. So even there could be a very high chance, if you're anything like some of the other people I've come across, that you don't find the term degrowth very embraceable. It's not a very warm term. I've certainly met a lot of people who don't like the term, but just keep an open mind and we'll see where we get to by the end. Um, when we talk about degrowth, I think it's really important to first talk about growth and so that we understand growth a little bit better. And I'm specifically here talking about economic growth. This, When I'm critiquing growth, I'm talking about economic growth. I'm talking about GDP growth the year on year on. So um, GDP, which is gross domestic product, is a poor metric of human well-being. And I honestly don't think there's many people who would suggest it's a really good measure, that we should be using it. And, and in the way that we're using it currently, where it's the sole metric, it's the most important thing. We've, we have other metrics, but they fall below GDP. And if GDP starts to decline, then all those other metrics go by the wayside. It's all about GDP. I want to share this quote with you. It's from Robert F. Kennedy um, from a speech he made in March 1968 when he was presidential candidate. He says, um, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children. Sorry, gross national product was GDP before, before GDP came along. It does not allow for the health of our our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debates or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. And the first time I read that, it actually changed the whole way I saw everything. And I don't know if I've been the same person since I saw it. It started me on the big degrowth rabbit hole. Um, and at this point, I might just let just talk about what GDP is. So GDP is the sum of financial transactions in an economy over a set period of time. And what we mostly are concerned about is how much those transactions are increasing based on that previous period. So um, a couple of things will make it increase, we'll consume and produce more, the population will increase, or we will commodify more things. So things that we used to be able to access for free now have a price tag attached to them and we spend money on them so they get included in the GDP where they previously wouldn't have been. So GDP and material footprint are highly correlated. When we talk about material footprint, we mean all the things that go into what we produce and consume. So essentially, at the end of the day, it mostly comes from, well, it all comes from the planet. So we're talking about the fish we take out of the ocean, the rainforest we fell, the native forests that um, get turned into wood chips. We're talking about the metals and rare earth minerals that we take out of the ground. We're talking about the soils that we um, use when we grow things. So it's just the sum of everything that we're using. And G global GDP here is orange. A material footprint here is the purple bluish line and they're in lockstep they they move together which makes sense really we're consuming and producing some things there's services in there but for the most part we're moving goods around the planet and so is energy and gdp so uh, gdp being the blue line energy being the red line and they're moving together as well and I want to share with you this quote from economist, and he's an Australian, Australian economist. His name is Stephen Keane. And he says that energy is the key put into everything we do. It's no surprise that they move together because labor without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture. So we need energy to create the things that we're uh, counting in financial metrics. But um, Maybe surprising to some people, GDP and well-being are not in lockstep. They're not closely correlated. So we've got here GDP in blue and GPI, which is the genuine progress indicator, in yellow. And you can see from about the late 1970s to the late 19 or to the early 1980s, they were previously moving in the same direction. And then they uh what's the correct word? <laughs> decoupled. They decoupled and now they don't move together. And 
really globally at the, that first chart on the left hand side our well-being hasn't increased in decades is what that chart shows me so the genuine progress indicator takes into consideration the social and environmental metrics that the gdp ignores and then um, I think it's also important to recognize that GDP growth is very unevenly distributed. So this chart here in the dotted red boxes, you can see that the bottom 50% of the world's population, so this is over the period 1995 to 2021, so 26 years, let's say the bottom 50% uh, of the world's population was 3.5 billion people. Over that 26-year period, they captured 2% of global wealth growth and the top 1% captured 38% of global wealth growth. And this is because the profits from business activity go to the owners of capital. Like that is how the system works. This is not a flaw. This is not something we need to fix. This is the system working as designed. So the owners of capital need to continually reduce both the cost of labor and of natural resources to keep achieving the growth um, ambition that they just intrinsically have as part of their reason for being. I think this is a really important quote too, so I'll read it out. That I often, I, I talk about degrowth a lot and so I know what some of the key pushbacks are and one of them is that I want to hurt poor people. <laughs> it's basically what I hear a lot and, um, you know, it's not true. But there's this notion that through growth we will um, eradicate poverty and this is a quote from the book, the, a book called The Divide, who was written by um, economic anthropologist Jason Hickel. In it, he says, to eradicate poverty at $5 a day, global GDP would have to increase 175 times its present size. So as, you, as we just spoke about, in other words, it means we need to extract, produce, and consume 175 times more commodities than we presently do. Even if such outlandish growth were possible, the consequences would be disastrous. We would quickly chew through our planet's ecosystems, destroying the forests, the soils, and most importantly, the climate. There is simply no way this can be achieved without triggering truly catastrophic climate change, which, apart from anything else, would obliterate any potential gains from poverty reduction. And the other kind of common pushback is that growth can be greened, but it's just not possible. There's no evidence that growth can be greened, not in the way we need it to be. It needs to happen globally. It needs to happen across all the metrics, not just um, greenhouse gas emissions. It needs to happen for a sustained period of time. And it's just not happened. Um, we've not seen it happen. There's no evidence to suggest that it is possible. And certainly not within the timeframes that we have. Like we know this is urgent. We need to be doing this now. So as Vandana Shiva says, nature shrinks as capital grows. The growth of the market cannot solve the very crisis it creates. I won't spend much time on this chart just because I'm worried about having enough time as it is, but we adopted the GDP metric around the 1950s. It was sort of after the, the end of World War II. And um, this is just some charts. You can sort of see the faint line on each of the white boxes. The faint line represents 1950, and it just shows how every social and earth system metric gets worse after that date. <laughs> He says, um, so there's a earth system scientist, he unfortunately passed away this time last year, named Professor Will Steffen. And he says that um, these changes that we see in the earth system are directly linked to the changes in the global economic system, basically the adoption of the GDP. We are now transgressing six of nine planetary boundaries, but we act as if we're only crossing the carbon emissions planetary boundary or the climate change boundary so we tend to just focus on climate change as a problem when we know there's a whole host of other issues we should be dealing with and we're living as if we have 1.7 planet earth so the way that um, can be translated is that earth overshoot day was on the 2nd of august last year and to give you some context in 1970 earth overshoot day landed on the 31st of december so in 50 years 53 years we've managed to to start using the resources as if we had a whole planet, well, 0.7 of another planet, which we just know isn't possible. But when we look at it as a global average like that, it really masks some underlying issues. And that is that some countries are living as if we have two, three, four, five, or six planet Earth. So my home country, Australia, our Earth, Earth overshoot day fell on March the 23rd. 
we're living as if we have 4.5 planet Earth. If you're in the US, you're living as if you have five. If you're in Qatar, you're living as if you have six. So all of the countries on this chart um, represent countries who are living as if they have more than one planet. If you go to the Earth Overshoot Day website, there's a whole list of countries who don't have an Earth Overshoot Day. If I had to guess, I'd say there's about 100 countries because those 100 countries are living within the means of the planet. So it's very, it's a very um, uneven impact on the planet and it varies by country. Emissions and wealth are positively correlated. So I think this is a, such a fascinating chart where it shows you that the wealthiest 10% of the world's population are responsible for 49% of um, carbon emissions and the poorest 50% of the world's population. So let's say somewhere between 3.5 and 4 billion, depending on the timing of this chart are responsible for only 10% of lifestyle consumption emissions. This, this chart is really important for people to recognise that this is not a population problem. This is a lifestyle problem. This is a model of development problem. This is a consumption and production, pro pro production problem. And there is no country meeting human needs within planetary boundaries. So this chart here, ideally we'd be up in the top left-hand corner where you can see the green donut that is essentially Kate Rayworth's um, donut economics model uh, where the inner ring is social well-being metrics and the outer ring is the planetary boundaries and we should be squished into the space in between the two. The closest country there is Costa Rica which is widely recognized as being the most sustainable country on earth but even it's still too far away like it's tra transgressing three planetary boundaries um, yeah, I just find it really fascinating that really this, this chart here tells me that our model of development, the way we think we meet human needs, is not sustainable. Like something has to change because if all of those yellow countries move to where those purple countries are, we've triggered catastrophic climate change. Like it's just not going to work. And yet we continue to grow our economies. So 3% growth every year is a doubling every 24 years. So if you consider that we're already breaching six of nine planetary boundaries, how can we double what we're producing and consuming every year? Like it's crazy. It means in a hundred years time, the economy will be 19 times larger than it is today. Um, yeah. So I, I do get told a lot that degress sounds terrible because everything in nature grows, but I think it's important to remember that except for cancer, nothing in nature grows forever. And even cancer only continues to grow until it's killed its host. Um, so instead of doing anything about how much we're producing and consuming, we're going to rely on technologies that do not currently exist. So this is a quote from John Kerry. He was in the UK. It was April, 2021. <laughs> and he said, you don't have to give up a quality of life to achieve some of the things that we know we have to achieve. That's the brilliance of some of the things that we know how to do. I'm told by scientists that 50% of the reductions we have to make to get to net zero are going to come from technologies that we don't yet have that's just a reality. John Kerry here is talking about 2030 targets. He's not talking about 2050. So the idea that we're going to meet targets in six years time with technology we don't have yet sounds a little bit crazy to me. I, I don't know how you guys find it, but um, I'd rather we just start reducing our emissions than rely on fairy tale technologies. Or we're also relying on technologies that are not yet feasible at scale. So Within the IPCC IAMs, which is Integrated Assessment Models, there's a lot of reliance on BECS, which is Bioenergy Carbon Capture and Storage. Basically, you grow plants, you burn them, it creates energy. The CO2 that comes out of that process gets buried underground. But <laughs> I can't believe I have to say some of these things. It's so crazy. The amount of land we would require for some of the volumes I've put into the targets is equal to one to two times the size of India. Like at a time where we should be massively rewilding, we're talking about clearing land to grow some plants so we can keep producing more energy. Like it's actually nuts. Uh, this is a quote from Naomi Klein, um, her book, This Changes Everything, but she basically says, our economic system is at war with nature. So uh, more accurately, our economy is at war with many forms of life on earth, including human life. What the climate needs to avoid collapse is a contraction in humanity's use of resources. What our economic model demands to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed and it's not the laws of nature. And that's, you know, I really like this quote. It's such a stark reminder that we, this is a human construct, this economy, and it can be changed by humans. There's nothing about this that is, 
um, you know, fixed, like it can all be changed. We could change it tomorrow if we had enough people supporting such a change. So now that I've talked about growth for a little while, I, I want to talk to you about degrowth. Um, so what is degrowth? I um, define degrowth with two definitions. The first one is it's a planned and democratic reduction in material and energy throughput in overconsuming nations while improving well-being and global justice. D being down, um, being Latin for down. So there's a few different ways you can interpret D in um, Latin. And this in this definition, it means down. Uh, I think it's important here to highlight the planned element of degrowth. I often hear that degrowth is coming whether we like it or not. And what people mean when they say that is collapse may well come, but it's not where well, it's not a foregone conclusion that degrowth will come. We need a lot of political will to make that happen. But the alternative, like that, I often say to people that the alternative is not business as usual. It's not, you know, the future doesn't look like today. The future does look like collapse unless we do something very different. Um, in this definition, it's very much a very specific focus on over-consuming nations, and it's those nations that you saw on the chart that were consuming as if we had two, three, four, five, or six planet Earth. So we're not asking a nation that is already living within the means of the planet to reduce their um, consumption. And I love I love this part of the definition. It's while improving well-being and global justice. So there's a lot, and it's it's too much depth to go into to today's presentation, but it's something else I'm. I feel is really important. There's a lot of injustice in the current system. Just when I showed you the inequality charts, like that's that's not okay. Like, and we want to seek to change those things around and move the imperialism that's ingrained in some of the IMF and the World Bank and the debt systems that we have globally today. The second definition that I really like, it comes from a book called Pluriverse. It's written in an essay by Federico Di Mario and Serge Latouche. And it's a decolonization of the imaginary and an implementation of other possible worlds. <laughs> I just love it because I think that um, this there's sort of a hegemony of growth and um, this idea that we just need growth. We just growth is good, growth is more growth is better, everything should have growth. And I think it's really uh, hampered our imaginations and our ability to think differently. So in this instance, D is Latin for away from. So let's move away from growth. It applies to all countries and all people within those countries. And by that, I mean, let's stop using growth, economic growth. I'm always specifically talking about economic growth here to meet everyone's needs and simply meet those needs directly. If you've got a population of people who needs housing, let's provide them with housing. If you have a population of people who need access to food, let's create access to food. Not Let's not just assume that if we grow the economy, these things will fall out of it because it's a very inefficient way to do it. It's a very resource intensive way to do it. Uh, so degrowth is a phase to get back within the carrying capacity of the planet. So we're not talking about degrowing until we're using no resources. We're talking about degrowing until we're using the resources that our planet can sustain long term. Um, and, you know, there's lots of information about that. That's basically within the planetary boundaries. What's in a name? Uh, so in I get told a lot should be rebranded and, and despite how many times you get told that I'm very adamant that the term is right. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone should use it. If you, if you don't like it, don't use it. But I think it serves a really important purpose, which is why I continue to use it. Um, it's disruptive. It's provocative. It um, has been described as a missile word. It's certainly not one of those easy to dismiss words or easy to incorporate into the status quo and use it to double down on growth. So I see it with sustainability. I see it with regeneration. I see it with well-being economy. We just use it. We do whatever we're doing and we add that word to the front of it. So it's now sustainable development, even though it's not necessarily sustainable at all. Um, so it's honest and it can't be co-opted. And I, I keep coming back to the fact that if people don't like the sound of degrowth, then it's probably because they still think economic growth is good. And then the challenge then is to help people understand that economic growth is not good <laughs> we don't need more economic growth it's actually sending us sending us off an ecological cliff um so you know i would say things like if you um people are okay with the terms like decolonization that's because they realize that colonization is bad and that's we need, where we need to get to with degrowth degrowth is good growth is bad uh, i'm going to skip through this because i've been given the, the timer um 
So how would we implement degrowth? Universal basic services should be provided to everyone. It's through the process of providing universal basic service to, services to everyone. And I'm talking healthcare, education, public transport. You could even go so far as to say housing, food, quotas of energy, water, water and internet, all of these things don't need to be commodified and could just be provided to a population. And I mentioned earlier that Costa Rica is the most sustainable country on the planet. And one of the key reasons why is because they provide universal basic services and they've had a commitment to doing so since the 1950s and they shut down their military to fund it. So, you know, this idea that we can't fund these things, actually, I'm sure the money existed if we had uh, an ambition. Uh, you can reduce the working week so that any jobs that get taken out through closing down industries can be um, absorbed and shared or the, the people who are without a job can be can have access to jobs that are now being shared around. And a federally funded job guarantee so that anyone who wants to work can do so. And I love the thought of this because we could be working doing things that are good for the planet, not simply doing things that are good for capital. Um, and then once we've taken care of people's well-being so they're not reliant on a growth economy, this is how we decouple an economic system from the need for growth, then we start to scale down ecologically destructive industries such as fossil fuels, animal agriculture, uh, aviation, plastics, fast fashion, cars we don't need as many cars as we have now oversized new house builds these sorts of things we can uh, enact legislation to reduce plan or end planned obsolescence which we see a lot um this idea that everyone needs a new phone every year or two years is crazy we can cut and redirect advertising we can shift from ownership to usership so um for example my car sits in the driveway or in a parking lot 23 hours a day it only gets used one hour a day and that's pretty typical of most cars so someone else could be using that rather than have it sit in the driveway and you can reduce the you know the number of cars that are being produced um there's a, a more of a list there but i'm just going to keep flying through what would life in an in a degrowth economy be like uh, a performance economy should enable us to leave as much of nature safely untouched and as much of our time joyfully unworked and I just love that definition I, I feel like degrowth is such a reminder that there's more to life than than working and producing and consuming and that we could find all these untapped sides of our our personality and our humanity which would be a really beautiful thing this image here is from Jennifer Wilkins on LinkedIn and if you don't follow her already I highly recommend you do because she's a real um, leader in the degrowth space um, and we used GDP for a long time we've used it to avoid talking about equality even though actually we really need to based on the chart I showed you earlier. Dan O'Neill, he presented at the EU Beyond Growth Conference last May. He said, growth has been used to avoid addressing inequality. If there's growth, there's hope. Everyone can get a bigger slice of the bigger pie. I'm sorry, a slice of the bigger pie. Um, but by addressing inequality, we can also release ourselves from growth. And it's a much better option for society and the environment. Tim Jackson, he also presented at the EU Beyond Growth Conference in May last year. I think this is a really important piece to note. If you think you are looking at a dysfunctional system that benefits no one, then you are probably not looking hard enough. The fine words and supportive gestures of those who cling to power hide vested interests intent on sabotaging progress. So while this system, this growth economy, doesn't serve most of the world's population, let's say you could almost say 99% of the world's population doesn't benefit from the system. That 1% is really going to hang on to it because they really do do very well out of this system and they're going to make changing the system to something that works for more people incredibly difficult. And actually, that's the end of my presentation.